So we're going to be reading 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and I'm going to be reading it in the ASV version. Thou therefore, my child, be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier on service entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enrolled him as a soldier. Thank you, Kia. Uh, as Ephraim already prayed earlier, we know that this is a special weekend that we're celebrating Memorial Day weekend. Uh, Memorial Day is a day of remembrance yes. where we can remember all the men and women who gave their lives, who sacrificed their lives, that we can enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy here in, our, in America. Uh, sometimes we take our freedoms for granted. When you look at some of the third world countries and some of the challenges that they face with their government, uh, we are most fortunate and blessed to live uh, in our nation. And today I want to take a moment to recognize and to honor all the men and women that have served in the military. Would you please stand, those of you? Uh, Ephraim, I know he's standing already. Oh, wow, look at this. Thank you, thank you, several. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, guys, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your devotion to our nation. The reason that we're able to enjoy all these freedoms because of men and women like you. Thank you a million times, uh, thank you. In our text from 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul uses several metaphors to describe Christ's followers, to describe believers. He uses the metaphor of an athlete. He also uses the metaphor of a farmer in chapter 2, but also a soldier. And that's what I want to concentrate on this morning. Paul was reminding Timothy to suffer hardship as a good soldier, as a successful soldier in the Lord's army. Every Christian, every Christ follower is a soldier of the cross. We are all in the Lord's army. Amen. Amen. Our commander in chief is the Lord Jesus. He is the one that recruited us. In John 15, Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. We have all been recruited into the Lord's army. Presently, we are in a spiritual battle. Those of you who are familiar with the book of Ephesians, chapter 6 and verse 10, where it talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that we are in a constant spiritual battle. It is a battle between righteousness and unrighteousness, and it's a protracted battle. It's a lifelong battle. And during wartime, everyone is needed. Everyone is important. And this morning, I want to talk to you about the characteristics of a good soldier. What makes us to be successful? A good soldier, number one, is willing to suffer hardship. In verse 3, Paul is telling the younger Timothy, he says, endure hardship. It's almost like he is warning Timothy that in his walk and in his ministry, he will face hardships. And friends, we must understand that as Christians, there will be times when we will face hardships, disappointments, and trials, all of us. Soldiers will be exposed to the elements, the cold, the heat, the storms. It comes with the territory. Paul and the other Christian workers suffered tremendous adversity, persecution, affliction, difficulty. We know from church history that many of the apostles were martyred for their faith. We are not exempt, friends, from trials and battles in the Lord's army. Jesus tells us that in the world we will suffer tribulation. That is an absolute fact, that we are going to face trials and difficulties. Paul, writing to the younger Timothy, and, and he is warning him. Now, Timothy was not cast in the same mold as the Apostle Paul. And Paul is telling him, brace yourself. There will be hardships. And one of the things you and I need to understand as Christians, we will face 
challenges. It's unfortunate. I've seen times when we lead someone to Christ, when we tell them about Christianity, when we ask them to open up their hearts to Christ, and then they face trials. They almost want to walk away because they feel like they're exempt. We are not exempt from facing trials. And Paul is telling Timothy, the younger Timothy, brace yourself for adversity and trouble. Being a soldier is not an easy task. It involves discipline. It involves sacrifice. It involves submission. Soldiers must submit to the rules and the regulations of their unit, of their company, of their army. Uh, when you enlist, when you're recruited, as we are, into the Lord's army, we have to submit to the authority of God. We have to submit to the word of God. Uh, when, when the bugle blows in the army, you get up. You can't tell your sergeant, I'm going to sleep in today. No, you listen. Uh, when the drill sergeant says, run, you run. You don't complain about the food, about the living quarters. We submit to the will of God. And our military manual is the word of God. Friends, we need to know the word of God. Amen. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17, to strengthen our faith, we need to get into the word of God. A successful soldier obeys the military manual, which is the Bible. Also, a successful soldier is fully devoted to his army. He's not distracted or sidetracked. <clears throat> by outside interest. In verse 3, in the Amplified Version, those of you who still have your Bibles or your phones out, it says, a soldier doesn't entangle himself with outside enterprises. The idea that as Christian soldiers, we are focused, that Christ is our priority. Jesus said we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other things shall be added unto us. So many times as Americans, we love our novelties. We're always looking for stuff and more stuff and more stuff. The Lord says, if you put me first, I'll take care of that stuff for you. So we're not distracted. By the way, Roman soldiers in the first century, they were forbidden to engage in secular or civilian affairs. Their primary function was the military. As Christian soldiers, we must not be careful that we don't get diverted with worldly entanglements. The allurement, friends, of the world is an ongoing battle for us. You remember what Jesus told Peter? He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Remember when, when he said, do you, do you love me? Do you love me more than your hobby? Do you love me more than your fishing? Do you love me more than your interest? I think the Lord says that to us as well. Do you love me more than your hobbies or your interests or your novelties? We need to honor the Lord and put the Lord uh, uh, first. Sometimes we, we think we're in a National Guard. Only during emergencies we're going to be Christians. Uh, friends, we can't treat God like a spare tire. You know what happens, right? You get a blowout, you go get your spare tire. You, had a pro you got a problem, and now all of a sudden you come to God. Oh, friends, God wants to be our friend. Not just merely in emergencies. Are you with me? Yeah, amen, amen. We're full-time soldiers. We want to honor the Lord. Uh, Paul says, don't get diverted. Don't get sidetracked. And there are so many things in America as, that, that are pulling for our attention. We need to stay focused on the Lord. And the enemy is subtle. The enemy may not uh, tempt you to do something immoral or, or kill somebody, but we have to be very careful. The devil's temptation is to engage you in some activity, some pleasure that slowly you drift away from God. And unfortunately, we see it happen. People drift away. They miss church one week and then another week. And then there's a ball game and then there's a picnic. And months later, they're so far away from God. We have to be careful of even those innocent activities, those subtle activities, the problem when it draws us away from God, it's suspect. Let's not be diverted or sidetracked from our devotion to Jesus. He is our commander in chief, no matter how innocent things are. And as pastor, as pastor, I've seen this happen. Do you know what the Bible says? It's the little foxes 
that devour the vines. Solomon 2.15. The big foxes probably couldn't get through, but the little foxes, they go under the fence and they tunnel like a groundhog. And then they get under the fence and then they start stealing the grapes. Sometimes it's those little things. It's not the major things, it's those little things. It seems so subtle and so innocent. And they take us away from God. Let's be careful. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Praise God. Uh, uh, thirdly, a good soldier recognizes their enemy. A good, a good soldier recognizes their enemy. Uh, Corey Tin Boone said, the first step on the way to victory is to recognize the enemy. The very first step on the way to victory is to recognize the enemy. As Christian soldiers, we all have a common enemy. It's Satan. And to be spiritually mature is to understand and to recognize the enemy of our soul. Can I say it again? To be spiritually mature is to understand and recognize that we have an enemy. He is trying to destroy us. Jesus warns us. By the way, I had such a wonderful time in Scripture this week. I was reading John 10 about the analogy of the shepherd and the sheep. Oh, if you get a chance, read it. But in that passage of Scripture, Jesus said the thief, the enemy, comes to kill and steal and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Thank God that we know Christ is here to give us life more abundantly. But we need to be cognizant of the fact that we have an enemy. He's trying to destroy us. You know, he attacked our forefathers with various temptations. He's been attacking us ever since. And as we get closer to the second coming of Jesus, when he knows the enemy, that his time is short, his t attacks will be more forceful and more potent. Jesus said, our enemy is the prince of this world. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That is you and me. Or his goal is to destroy us. Friends, I want to tell you, the devil, he has forfeited his relationship with God. There was a relationship that he had with God at one time. He forfeited that. And now he tries to get you and I to forfeit our relationship with God. By the way, 2 Corinthians 2.11. 2 Corinthians, you know what it says? We are not ignorant of his devices. We need to come to the place in our walk with God in our maturity, that we understand the strategy and the tactics that the enemy can use against us. Do you know what Paul says? That he can appear as an angel of light. You know what that means? The devil can come in and, and, and fool you and to think there's a message from God, what, in, what he's trying to do. We need to be spiritually alert. Are you with me? Sure, sure we do. We need to know, we, under, we need to understand the weapons he uses against us uh, um, that he can appear as a messenger from God. We need discernment. We need the Holy Spirit to help us understand. Listen to what Paul told the, the Christ followers in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 11.3. Paul said, I'm concerned. Actually, the, the word he used, he said, I'm afraid as the serpent, as the devil deceived Eve by craftiness, that your minds will be led astray. Paul was concerned. He founded the church. He was their original pastor. He was their first pastor. And in writing a letter, he's saying, guys, I'm hearing things. I'm seeing things. I'm concerned about you guys, that the enemy is leading you astray. And where's the battle? Right here. You know what I've often said? Our biggest battle is right here. We need to be careful. The enemy attacks us mentally, to try to get us to doubt, to for anxiety, discouragement, despair. Again, some of our biggest battles are right here. And the enemy, oh, friends, the enemy. Hey, how many times has this happened to me? Th does God really care? Does God really love you and your family? And when you're facing a trial or a heartache, the whisper gets louder. The enemy is a liar, friends. He has forfeited his relationship with God. He's trying to get us to do the same thing. And it's so often, it's right here. The battle is right here. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, casting down vain imaginations. Can't, when those thoughts count, you cast it down in the name of Jesus. 
Don't let it take residence up here. You know why? It'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. Cast it down in the name of Jesus. Quote scripture. Get into the word. Rebuke the enemy. Amen. We have the authority and the power to do it. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. When those thoughts come, cast it down. Fight against it. Don't entertain it. Don't fuel it. Rebuke it. Amen. We're a child of God. Amen. Cast them down. Bring every thought into the captivity of Christ. Discipline your mind and your thoughts. And everybody said, Amen. friends, I want to tell you, it's a lifelong battle for us. You say, I'm saved 20 years. The, the enemy will tempt you into doing something different than maybe when you're saved a week or two. But the temptation will be there. Listen to what Luke chapter 4 and verse 13 says. When the devil had finished every temptation against Jesus, it says the devil departed from Jesus until an opportune time. You know what that meant? He wasn't through. The enemy kept going after Jesus. The enemy, I want to tell you, friends, the enemy is a liar. And so often it's right here. We need to control and discipline. Didn't you wish, I've said it to you before, that you had a garbage disposal in your mind and you pushed a button? True. You know, friends, if, if you're struggling with thoughts and all, get into the Word. I want to even encourage you to start memorizing Scripture. You know, if you need, I'll write them down for you. Some Scriptures that I think will help you. But we're in a lifelong battle. We combat the enemy through the Word, through faith, discipline, perseverance. Stand fast on the promises of God. Amen. 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 God can turn our attacks into victories. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh. Number four, the soldier thinks of the whole army. The soldier is not merely thinking about himself. We're in this battle together, friends. We have the same Father who cares about us. We have the same Savior who loves us. We're all called and sanctified by the same Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul not only suffered for the Lord's sake, but he suffered for the church. The soldier not only thinks of himself, he thinks of the whole army. Friends, if a soldier is merely thinking about himself, he's disloyal, undependable. We're in the same army. We want to help. We want to assist others. Amen. When a fellow soldier is wounded, we try to nurse them back to health. We don't leave them to die on the battlefield. God forbid. We want to go and try to nurse that soldier back to health. Do all we can to love them and nurture them. Let's nurse, let's nurse our wounded. Let's be a blessing to the soldiers. Amen. Can I say this? It's impossible for the general to oversee the soldiers in any army. It is impossible for the pastor to oversee every member of the church. But we are members one with another. Look around. If there's someone that you know that may be hurting, that may be missing, let allow the, allow the Lord to use you to be a blessing, to support and pray for them. Let's not be selfish. Are you with me? Let's think of others. Many of God's great soldiers have been wounded in battle. You know, the Bible talks about fiery darts hitting us. I'm there, man. How many fiery darts? Sometimes you get hit with a fiery dart and you pull it out, and an hour later, boom, boom another one comes. Thank God for the church. You know, I always felt like the church was a hospital. I mean, we can use a lot of terms to describe a church. But when you're hurting, thank God we can come and we could be of help and nurse you and help you and pray with you. Galatians 6.1, are you familiar with that? I love that verse. It says, if any man be overtaken in the fault, if any man stumbles, whatever the reason, if he's lying on the, on, on the battlefield, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. If someone is hurting, the Lord calls on us to nurse them back to health, to try to help. Are you with me? If you've been wounded, friends, I want to tell you, we've all been wounded. If you've been wounded in battle, allow the Lord to heal you. 
Don't go AWOL. Don't get upset. Be still and know that I'm God, the Bible says. You know, I've told you a million times, my favorite phrase in all of the Bible is Psalm 23.3. He restoreth the soul. Friends, allow the Lord to restore you. You, you know, you may be hurting today. Some situation, maybe it's personal, maybe it's a fa- I thank God that you're here. Allow the Lord Jesus to minister to you. Allow the Lord Jesus to heal you. Are you with me? And if need be, reach out to somebody. Reach out to someone. When you're hurting, it's not the time to get isolated. By the way, if you isolate yourself, you see what I said about the devil? He's going to come and get you, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, nobody cares at that church. Christians, you know that? Man, don't, whatever you do, if you're hurting, draw closer to someone. Iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. When we're weary, when we're hurting, it's not the time to isolate ourselves. It's the time to get closer. Call someone. Say, listen, would you pray with me? Are you with me? Sometimes we get wounded by friendly fire. You get wounded by someone with the same uniform you wear. It shouldn't happen, but it often does. I think of what Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It shouldn't happen. Moses, one of his biggest ad- adversaries, his sister. Are you with me? His sister Miriam, Joseph, Moses, his sister Miriam. Joseph's brothers sold them into slavery. Sometimes our own flesh and blood, and sometimes the church of God hurts us. And Jesus warns us, truth divides. If you embrace truth and light and righteousness, sometimes your family may disapprove. But friends, God forbid, let us not ever wound or hurt someone with the same uniform we're wearing, those uh, of like precious faith. And everybody said, truth number five, a good soldier wants to please his commanding officer. A good soldier wants to please his commanding officer. Notice in verse four, if you still have your Bibles, that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Friends, the Lord Jesus enlisted us. We want to please our commander in chief. The soldier forfeits his agenda, his personal rights. His will is absorbed in the will of the commanding officer. The life, by the way, I've often said what Jesus teaches us, he models for us. In John 8, 29, you know what it says about Jesus? Jesus said, I always do that which pleases him. Jesus models for us obedience. He models for us submission, that he submitted to his Father's will, that we in turn, we submit. Obedience is mandatory in the Lord's army. Obedience is mandatory in the Lord's army. Listen. A soldier doesn't tell the general where he wants to go and how he wants to do things. It's the other way around. How many times I found in the church people... We're going to tell God what they want to do. It doesn't work that way, friends. It doesn't work that way. Are you with me? A soldier doesn't pick his mission. A soldier doesn't pick his assignment. They obey their commanding officer. Soldiers, officers, are sometimes reassigned. And when they reassign, they obey. I want to tell you, friends, I've told you a million times, I have a tremendous, tremendous respect for authority. The reason I am here today is because I listened to the authority that God placed over me. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself. I, sometimes in the church, there's too much individualism. You, you know, you want to do this, you want to, wait a minute here. There's an authority. I'm not getting too many amens today. But it's here. I'm preaching the word of God to you. I want to tell you, 
a leader will give, have to give an account to Almighty God. In the book of James, it tells us how he treated you. But I want to tell you, you're going to have to give an account whether you listened and obeyed the leader that God placed before you. Are you with me? Uh, we have to be careful. People want to do their own thing. It's too much. It's no good. It damages the body. And I've heard people, they justify what they're going to do. No, they don't want to sit, submit to authority. You know, if you're not teachable, you're not reachable, right? People, they want to rationalize. I even know they spiritualize their disobedience. That's not good, friends. I'm going to move on, lest I get myself in trouble. Uh, truth number six, God turns our battles into blessings. I want to tell you, friends, if you're facing a battle, hang in there. The Lord is going to see you through. He's going to bless you. Amen. He's going to see you through it. The hammer shatters glass, but it forges steel. You know, what we call adversity, God often sees opportunity. The Bible says all things work together for good. For them that love God, for them that are called according to his purpose. Sometimes we're facing adversity and we don't like it. And yet the Lord has a divine plan in it. I think of Paul. He had that thorn in the flesh. It was something physical. Lord, you got to get rid of it. You got to remove it. The Lord said, I'm not going to remove it. My grace is sufficient for you. God uses battles that we face to strengthen us. What we call tribulation, God calls growth. God uses the battles that we face to refine us. Job 23.10, for when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I know some people, oh, no, God doesn't do that. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. God wants to remove the impurities from us. And he often uses trials to do it. Oh, not too many amens. It's okay. You're getting the word today, friends. For when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The Lord turns up the heat sometimes. You know, I've often said God accepts us the way we are. Man, you, you may have fleas all over you, bed bugs all over you. God will pick you up and embrace you, but he loves you too much to leave you in that condition. He's going to clean you up. The Lord wants to clean us up so we can shine, so we can grow, so we can be a blessing to others. Amen. Sure. Amen. John Brangle. This guy was a street preacher. He'd go out in the street and preach. One day, somebody threw a brick at him, and he was seriously injured. He couldn't work or preach for almost two years. During the meantime, he wrote a book, Helps for Holiness. It became a bestseller. It was translated into different languages. His wife said, if there would be no brick, there would be no book. God can turn our bricks into blessings. You know what Joseph told his brothers after what they did to him? He said, you know, you guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God turned that situation around. Amen. Come on, are you with me? God meant it for good. All things work together for good for them that love God. There's a silver lining in our challenges. I know it hurts, man. I know when you're in the midst. Oh, man, come on, Tony. You know, what are you, what are you? I know it hurts. I know when we're in the hardship. I know it. You know, years ago, when I was at Shrewsbury, I preached the message, and I couldn't believe the, the, the compliments, the people that, that they really... And you know what it was? The whole theme, look for the blessing. The whole theme was, in our adversity, in our daily trials, in our daily difficulties, there was always a silver lining. Look for the blessing. You may not see it the day, that day you're in that trial. You may not see it for a week, but Lord willing, you can look back and say, you know what? Even in that trial, God made something beautiful out of that trial. Hallelujah. He does, friends. He does. Hannah Smith said, look upon your battles. Listen to what she said. Look upon your battles as God's chariots sent to carry your soul into a higher place of spiritual achievement. Amen. For every promise, there's every problem, there's a blessing, there's a promise. And everybody said, 
You know, in the book of Acts, chapter 26 and 27, King Agrippa sent Paul to Rome to be tried in a Roman court. And it's really interesting that Paul never, never rebelled. He completely submitted to going to Rome. Paul yielded. And, and, and he spent several years in Rome in prison under house arrest. By the way, I visited that prison while I was in Rome. I visited the catacombs. Let me tell you, friends. I, let me say this. I looked for the internet. There was no internet in Paul's cell. This is literally Paul. I'm, it, you had to pay five bucks to go down and look at the cell. There was no gymnasium. There was no weight room. It was a dungeon. And Paul was there for two years. And you know what he did? He witnessed to the guards. When he was brought before the magistrates, he witnessed to them. Are you with me? Years later, when Paul was writing Philippians, you know what he said? All the saints uh, greet you, especially those in Caesar's household. Caesar hated Christians. God used that experience with Paul to save people in Rome. What am I saying? There was a silver lining. Even in Paul's trials, being in that dungeon, Paul was still used by God. Amen. What am I saying? God can turn our battles into blessings. Amen. Paul wasn't bitter at his experience. If you read, by the way, a lot of the epistles that he writes, he's in jail. You know, Paul, he looked at it. I'm here. I'm going to use this opportunity to witness. You're in that trial. Use that opportunity to draw closer to the Lord. You know, in and of itself, that's the blessing. Through the trial, if you're able to get closer to the Lord, you're going to spend more time in prayer. You're going to spend more time reading the Word. That's the blessing right there. Paul used his prison experience as a harvest field. Amen. He won many to Christ. One more lesson. One more lesson about a soldier being a successful soldier. Going AWOL is not an option for us. Leaving the army, abandoning the army, friends, it's not an option for us. Maybe you're reassigned to another post. That's a possibility. But abandoning, deserting the army, no. No, no, friends. Friends, we need to stay at our post. And you say, but, oh, Tony, I face some challenges and disappointments. We're all there, friends. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. We're all, we're all going to face trials. We're all going to face difficulties, challenges. But, friends, there, heaven awaits us. You're going to go back into the world? Come on, friends. Remember what Jesus says, Peter, when there were those that were following him for their stomach's sake for a free lunch? And Peter said, Jesus said, Peter, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave? And Peter said, no, you got the words of eternal life. Amen. And our trials and our difficulties, friends, backsliding is not an option. Victory awaits us. Just hang in there. Hang in there. Hang in there. Hang in there. Paul told the Corinthians, be steadfast, unmovable. Dig your heels in no matter what. Resolve, if it's going to be just you and Jesus at the end, you're going to be there. Amen. Victory awaits us. On this Memorial Day weekend, what if 30% of the U.S. Army and military deserted in World War II? Would we be here today? I don't think so. Are you with me? One other thing I, I want to close with this. You know, during wartime, everybody's needed. The soldiers, the officer. You need the chefs. Are you with me? You need the mechanics. You need the nurses. You need people in the factory. You need doctors. You need, I mean, come on, the list goes on and on. Everybody's important. Stay at your post. Stay at your post. You're important. Remember, listen, friends, remember it's the Lord who recruited you, not man. It's the Lord who recruited you. Someday you're going to hear those words and it's going to be worth it. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It'll be, oh, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it when we see Jesus face to face. I know you're going to, we're all going to go through trials. If you read the book of Hebrews where it talks about people of faith, 
Near the end, you know what it says? Some of those people never received the promise, but they still lived in faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Impossible. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder to those that diligently seek him. Our reward will be here, but our greatest reward will be when we see Jesus face to face. It'll be worth it all. Hallelujah. And we'll say, oh, you mean I got all tribulated, that little problem I had? I nearly went out? No, no. AWOL is not an option. Friend, as your local, regional commander, thank you for your service. Thank you for your loyalty to the commander-in-chief, and that's Jesus. It's not man. It's not the pastor. It's Jesus. He's our commander-in-chief. You know, just this week I said something to somebody. We do it for the Lord. What we do, we do as unto the Lord. We don't do it as unto men. We do it as unto the Lord. All that we do, we do as unto the Lord. But thank you for your service, your loyalty. Uh, on behalf of the commander-in-chief, the commander-in-chief, thank you, amen. The king of glory, thanks you for your service, for your loyalty, for your devotion, for your commitment, amen. Someday we're going to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the rest of the Lord, amen. Amen. And can I close with this? If you're aware, in closing, of a fellow soldier who's wounded, who's in need, do something. Call, visit, pray. Do something. And everybody said, amen. 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 You know, uh, with your head bowed, maybe you're here today and You haven't given your life to Christ. Friends, it'll be the best, best, best decision that you will ever make. And you would say, Tony, I'm ready. I'm ready today to do that. I understand that God loves me, that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. I want to commit my heart. I want to commit my life to Jesus. If that's you, just slip up your hand. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. Is there anybody? would say, Tony, would you please pray in closing? Anyone? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I thank the Lord the past couple weeks there have been those that have responded to God be the glory. Hallelujah. Lord, you've said that you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Continue to build us, nurture us, strengthen us, and use us in your service. Whatever capacity you choose, we're going to say yes to our commander-in-chief. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Lord, again, we thank you for all the military men and women that served our nation to make it the nation that we have today. We pray even that you would bless all the men and women that are active in service. All over the world, they're active in service. Bless them, protect them, keep them, God, we pray. And help us to honor you. Help us to be successful soldiers in your army. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.